for my transcript and handle and this as well. Beautiful. So, um, as you know, it's uh, a guided interview or conversation. So there are points of it that are a bit scripted. There are questions that I will bring you back to, but the intent of it is for it to feel as organic as possible. Um, so as we get started, thank you again for agreeing to join me on this one-on-one -on -one interview. As you know, the aim is to explore your experiences within the domains of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, your participation in this interview is voluntary, so if at any point you would like to step out, take a break, and early um, pause, you're absolutely welcome to do so. Just let me know. Um, these interviews, as you know, are recorded in order for transcripts to be generated. The transcripts will be anonymized, so even if names or identifiers are used, they will be taken out at the time of the transcript generation. Um, do I have your consent to start? Yes. Beautiful. Um, before we actually get started with the interview, do you have any questions for me? No. All right. Um, for the record, uh, can you please state your age, your gender, and your role at the Cancer Center? Uh, 57 years old, male, uh, radiation oncologist, uh, and, uh, chair of department. Beautiful. Um, so the first question starts by asking you to define or explain three terms. So we'll go through those sequentially. So how would you define or explain to someone the term equity? Uh, so equity is uh, conceptually uh, the idea of ensuring that uh, any individual, regardless of uh, their background, has um, an equal opportunity to achieve, I guess, a particular outcome, uh, and that uh, there are no, um, you know, there are no factors or characteristics about that individual uh, that should impede their ability to achieve that outcome. Meaning that if there are vulnerabilities, uh, those should be identified and supported to ensure uh, an individual, if you will, has um, has the opportunity to achieve you know, whatever outcome is desired, similar to anybody else. Fair enough. Um, the second term, how would you define or explain the term uh, diversity? Diversity is uh, really the characteristic that makes everybody unique. Um, uh, so uh, diversity are a set of characteristics that will, um, you know, uh, discriminate is too hard a term, but will differ will will potentially differentiate uh, between individuals within a group, and they can of course be uh, um, they can be differences in gender, they can be differences in sexual orientation, they can be differences in racial background, they can be differences in socioeconomic status. Um, basically, those essentially all all of those various different. Uh, unique characteristics that make that individual unique. Mm -hmm. Obviously different from other individuals. For sure. And then lastly, how would you define or explain the term inclusivity to someone? So inclusivity, inclusivity is essentially what's uh, achieved when barriers are broken down so that uh, it, it requires, um, it requires awareness of the fact that there may be barriers in place that could exclude certain individuals from a particular, uh, I don't know, a particular grouping or a particular role that when identified can, um, can be addressed so that, uh, uh you know, uh, an individual can participate, if you will, or achieve something, um, irrespective of their background and can contribute to, um, you know, a group, if you will, that represents everybody that makes up whatever's, whatever's considered, whatever's considered, I guess, uh, part of the, you know, the sort of the social and intellectual fabric of a particular grouping. Fair enough. So keeping those domains in mind, 
do you see these domains influencing the patient-clinician interaction or relationship in any way? And if so, in what ways? Well, they can, I guess if you're asking the word influence, I mean, they can, they, they can affect, I guess. You're talking about clinician patient interactions now. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, they can, they can definitely, uh, affect, um, affect the interactions, uh, either consciously or unconsciously. And I mean, uh, as clinicians, individuals can have conscious and unconscious biases, uh, as well as the fact that depending on an individual's background and where they are, where they're from, where they're from, there can even be structural factors uh, that can, you know, sort of affect the interaction where people may, you know, may, I guess, um, interact, assess, decide on things um, based on some of these factors. So can you explore that a little bit more? So you've mentioned things like people holding implicit or explicit biases. Are there any examples that come to mind? Uh, Examples. Uh, I mean, there, I mean, even if somebody's trying to apply um, uh, research principles and trying to make a therapeutic decision and fails to recognize the fact that, for example, you know, research in certain health instances, I mean, even sort of things like the cholesterol story, the cardiac story, where the majority of participants in a trial, uh, in trials, trials that were published that eventually led up to guidelines were predominantly white males. Uh, And, you know, you know, sort of just not really taking into account um, uh, the fact that they may have somebody sitting in front of them that doesn't sort of meet the profile of that included population, and then starting to think about whether those, you know, whether that research actually, um, uh, whether that research and those findings basically are applicable to the individual sitting in front of them. Fair enough. So if we were to deep dive, I think, a bit more to your experiences, your lived encounters, do you have an anecdote or examples that come to mind where um, you can really think back and see where the domains of equity, diversity, and inclusion directly affected your patient interactions, such that, like, for example, it influenced patient decision-making, establishing trust, breaking bad news, some sort of communication um, moment that, that really resonated within the the parameters of these domains. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, way back, um, as you know, I was a family, uh, I was a family physician and in, as part of my training, I actually, um, had an opportunity to go to Northern Ontario and actually go on reserve. And I really wasn't prepared actually for the cultural differences. I really had very little knowledge at that point. Uh, I mean, this was way, this was well before, um, you know, uh, a lot of the current, you know, the truth and reconciliation process took place. I mean, it was recognized that there were social determinants that were different, but even culturally um, issues of uh, colonialism and structural racism wasn't really aware of. And I really couldn't understand why, you know, I would sort of come in as this young clinician doing these clinics all full of energy. And I, I would meet with individuals that s- seem to have these, uh, you know, that would have chronic illnesses uh, that were not being well controlled uh and that i'd have interactions that weren't you know sort of the usual interactions that i would have had with individuals in terms of back and forth information sharing um it was even at the point where uh many individuals particularly older individuals uh, on reserve didn't make eye contact and that was uncomfortable for me but i didn't really understand it and i didn't really know how to work around it and it made me feel uh pretty um it made me feel like i was an outsider but i needed to i I didn't have the tools that i needed to understand how to get inside that um and you know understand uh, understand enough about people to have an interaction and i mean there were you know many many layers before even getting to you know the concept of you know western medicine meta medical approaches to individuals and uh you know, there were individuals that I would see where there was probably, um, 
very clear just sort of acquiescence to whatever mm-hmm. it was that I was saying because nothing else really was said. So mm-hmm. there was this inclination to just kind of fill the airspace as opposed to allow things to be quiet, know, know how to ask, you know, some of the probing questions to, to better understand the situation and probably didn't provide particularly good care. Were there any skills that you then over the course of that experience or that elective or that placement have to gain or yeah. internalize that, you know, sort of near the end found there to be improvement or, or was it still so early? Yeah, no, I, no, I, I, I immediately, I mean, I, you know, that was part of, I guess, what was built in to the, to the training and being able to work with um, some of the preceptors to really have a bit of a better understanding. I mean, um, being able to do a little bit of reading and actually, um, you know, there were some Aboriginal sort of liaison health workers uh, with whom I spent a little bit of time who could sort of explain to me what it was that was happening and give me some strategies um, for how to, you know, how to, how to, how to try to improve the interactions. And you, you share that that was during your experiences as a family physician. Are there any that stand out in your mind as an oncologist in your time as a rat Um, I think I was, I mean, there are, there are, uh, there are a few. Um, again, I've had some interactions with individuals of African background who, uh, again, um, very diff- uh, somewhat deferential and um, had sort of challenges in communication and sort of came to the understanding that, uh, you know, sort of a Western, a Western health framework was not one that was uh, useful, I guess, uh, in terms of decision making. Um, I'm a radiation oncologist. So around, for example, uh, decisions about whether or not to proceed with radiation treatment and being able to sort of take a little bit more time to explore, um, you know, why um, and trying to reframe things, I guess, in a in a manner that was more um, uh, in terms of their ability to make a decision. Are there particular strategies, tools, um, words or phrases that you've started to integrate into your practice that allow people to engage in that dialogue with you earlier? Um, yeah, I think part of it is taking it uh, sort of taking it back a step and probing, you know, what the meaning of things are for individuals and, uh, um, you know, exploring their their understanding within the context of their life experience which often will lead to discussions about how, you know, things um, from their perspective are interpreted. Mm-hmm. So it's really to have an understand, to really have an under, have an understanding of that individual's, um, you know, sort of lived, ex, you know, lived experience, cultural experience. I mean, obviously you think about sociodemographics, which can lead to other, you know, issues around what are the, what are the, uh, barriers that that individual faces, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Um, and when you it's taking the time and listening, I mean, it's really taking sure. the time. And, listening. and sometimes it is taking a step back and being able to identify within a conversation and say, being able to articulate and say, I, I don't, I don't know that we're communicating particularly well right now, and I, I have a, I, I have a concern that I'm not really understanding your perspective on what we're talking about. And I'm not really sure that you're understanding how I'm explaining things. So we, we need mm-hmm. to take a step back here. Mm-hmm. And so when you reflect and we'll go through it almost sequentially, but when you reflect on your time as a radiation oncologist, as a staff or as a trainee, were, were you ever formally trained within these domains? Um, you know, did you ever formally receive any orientation or sessions or, or training to help you um, really think about EDI more more in family medicine uh, more in my background in family medicine than in uh, than in oncology I would say and professionally I know that like with EDI being very much part of the current oh yeah absolutely life. there's been yeah no there's a lot been a lot of pro, there's been a lot of uh, professional um, um, sort of professional development particularly for you know my you know my leadership role as well so I'm um, you know, at this point, uh, I continue to sort of 
um, read about it, uh, understanding some of the important concepts, understanding things like white fragility, which I never really had a good understanding about, uh, trying to be more mindful of uh, unconscious bias. Um, there's been quite a bit of unconscious bias training, um, you know, through the university. There are now lots and lots of, through the faculty of health sciences, there are a lot of facilitators um, to try to help facilitate because as an individual, just reading about things doesn't allow an individual to overcome, probably needs somebody to reflect with, somebody to guide. Um, there are designated facilitators now. Uh, who have full formalized training in EDI, and we have a number of our staff are trained that way as well. Okay. So between my training and staff training, certainly within um, uh, recruitment, tenure, and promotion, uh, we now actually have um, – uh, there. there is going to be incorporation of formalized processes, which will include checklists. There are recommendations now in terms of the formation of committees. There are – recommendations and guidelines about how committee discussions occur, all of those sorts of things mm-hmm. um, are being incorporated. And um, it's it's a change for sure. Uh, it's a change. I think in oncology, we were a little bit more, I think, culturally ready for it. Um, perhaps, I mean, I, I guess because I don't have great insights into other specialty areas, I have to be a little bit careful about how I comment, but I've, I've, I feel that we were a little bit more um, – perhaps a little bit more prepared in oncology, but there are a lot of supports in place. And so you mentioned that through leadership and through the university, um, there has been this opportunity to get all this training. Was that mandated or was that something that you sought out because you knew it was available to you? Both. Both. And I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I continue to, I continue to seek it out. There were, um, uh, there were, Again, when you say mandated, I mean, there are, and early on when I sort of took my administrative role, uh, there were opportunities that, you know, we were, um, the senior leadership was encouraged to participate in, but it wasn't mandated, if you will. Mm-hmm. And culturally, would you say that there was um, a want and willingness to engage or was it? There's some reluctance um, because it is a cultural shift. It is, in, you know, encountering things that can be very hard or challenging to talk about and to, to reconcile with. Yeah. Uh, again, I can only speak personally. I embraced it. Um, my observation from colleagues is that um, colleagues generally embraced it. I mean, I think that McMaster University has been pretty good at recognizing the importance of ED, well, it's now EDIIA, um, right, including Indigenous and uh, accessibility as well um, in in terms of the, uh, you know, in terms of the spectrum of things to be considered. Um, and I think that most people are, are, you know, doesn't take a lot of convincing to understand that um, working within, you know, that framework and sort of embedding it into our culture and into our days and day, you know, day, daily, you know, sort of daily work and activities will just make us a better place. Mm-hmm. And, and even, even on some of those more, uh, you know, sort of conventional um, metrics. Mm-hmm. And so you, you talked about, you know, what I assume to be some more, heavy topics like discussing your your lived biases your implicit biases things like white fragility and and recognizing you know the spaces in which you walk relative to others what are some like emotions that these sorts of sessions evoke in an individual and and are they comfortable are they not and then when they're not how do you cope with that so yeah some of it can become quite uncomfortable when you get uh, introspective and you realize that uh, you you know you have probably um, developed, um, you know, developed within a context of structural racism uh, in terms of your, you know, own experience. Um, I've tried to learn to embrace the discomfort, um, be honest about it, be honest with yourself. Uh, I've now caught myself a few times when, uh, you know, I've been thinking about things to sort of say, you know, you're, you're, there's probably, there's probably some bias there's either either some bias going here 
or there's some avoidance happening because you're in an uncomfortable space and you're avoiding what, you know, um, you know, part of it for me is to not hesitate to call for help. So if I feel like I'm getting in trouble or if I'm getting in a space where I feel like I need some help, I will, uh, I will call for help and I don't have, you know, I don't have, um, uh, I, I don't, I don't sort of have difficulty reaching out now. Um, there are lots and lots of, uh, you know, lots and lots of, uh, sort of opportunities. Um, and the reality is, I think that, uh, you have to recognize that, um, it's more likely the change will come if you allow yourself to get uncomfortable. Because if it's too comfortable, then it just is a bit of an intellectual exercise and real change may not actually occur. And are these conversations that you engage with, with your colleagues within the division, um, you know, like, is that, is that part of a conversation that is being had now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and what do those conversations look like? Is it something that is more, um, formalized? Be like, these are things that we need to integrate as we go forward as a division, or is it more like, what, what have you experienced? Let's talk about, you know, that. It's, it's, it's sort of in between. I mean, it's probably been a little bit more informal than formalized, but like I said, um, having had, in particular, having had, um, senior leadership go through some of the offerings of EDI training at the university and then having staff actually fully trained. And as you know, um, you know, uh, the reality is that, uh, staff will sort of stick more to a formalized process. That's just the nature of, the nature of how they work, which is an advantage, uh, as opposed to sometimes faculty can be a little bit more informal. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but it is becoming more and more formalized. And as you know, the university is developing, is con- continuing to develop an EDI framework and is now in the process of recruiting an, an actual, an actual, um, the faculty of health sciences is recruiting, um, uh, a vice dean in that area, which, uh, I think will go a long way to helping, you know, sort of further develop the policy and give directions to the various different academic departments. Um, as you know, it's also happening on the hospital side as well. EDI has been identified on the hospital side. I haven't, I haven't participated in those activities yet. They kind of got put on hold a little bit, I think, um, through the COVID pandemic, but it was interesting because, um, and as you know, there was some stuff that was coming from CCO as well. Um, so part of, what we had to think about was the fact that it was coming in sort of three directions of the three major affiliations people had, and they weren't completely integrated. So it was a little bit, it it did lend itself. I mean, I remember giving some feedback saying it was a little bit confusing. It was starting to be a little bit confusing to people who weren't really thinking about it a lot. Um, And I'll ask you to, I think, reflect again in terms of your history. So when can you recall being the first time, either professionally or personally, that you were faced with these domains and like maybe not knowing the language or knowing that this is exactly what was going on, but you you kind of came to an awareness that this was a topic or this was something that impacted people's lives and that was different from your own lived experience? Oh yeah, that was, I mean, that was definitely during initial, well, probably even in university, actually, in undergrad. But I think, I think it was actually in undergrad. Um, because I came, I mean, my, uh, my educational background, I mean, if we're going really deep here, you know, my educational background, um, was, uh, I went to sort of Jewish day school uh, up until grade eight. Maybe you can sort of use a more generic term instead of the actual specifics. But I went to a cultural, let's say I went to a cultural day school. So, of course, going to a cultural day school, it was mostly people exactly like me. Um, so my first big eye opener was going to high school, in fact. So I went to a suburban high school where I lived in a suburb um, where there was a fair bit of diversity. And that was the first big eye opener to say, wow. And it was um, at that point, I mean, again, think about it. I was, you know, I was sort of 13 or 14 years old. Um, it was uh, exciting more than anything else. It was really exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you started to talk to people about their lived experience and what it was like in their households. And it was very, very different from mine. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
part of it was just kind of processing it um, uh, and recognizing that there were individuals that I wouldn't, you know, I'd have conversations with people where it was clear to me that I didn't really understand mm-hmm. what it was that they were talking about. And they probably didn't really understand what it was that I was talking about. So mm-hmm. then you had an opportunity to interact and explain a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was that was probably the earliest. It was sort of through high school and undergraduate university. Yeah. So really, I mean, it sounds like those first worries of just even recognition and acknowledgement, but then also being very open to learning and, and to having a dialogue um, as opposed to being necessarily closed off about it, as I think some people sometimes are. Yeah, they were. And I mean, you know, again, I can I can recognize that from my from the background that I came from, again, with this cultural school, there were clearly biases, um, you know, that, that came at that level. And then, um, you know, when I was in high school, you know, you'd, you'd meet with people that would say things that were quite obviously racist, Mm -hmm. uh, quite obviously racist, like badly racist. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, and then people would laugh and, you know, all of those things that would happen. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I remember feeling pretty uncomfortable, although I stayed quiet about it. So there were some people that even at that point, I was struck by how they would very, you know, quickly raise it as an issue. Um, I tended to stay quiet, which also made me feel a little bit guilty, but I, um, but I, I stayed quiet about it. Mm-hmm. But I recognized it and it was very uncomfortable. Yeah. And, and I mean, those sorts of things stay with you clearly. I mean, this is still something that you remember vividly. Um, and so I, I think in a lot of ways, those early forays or those early encounters really inform the context by which we view later understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, now, shifting to a, a slightly different question, um, have you in recollection, like, do you remember witnessing an encounter by either a colleague or another staff person or even a trainee where they integrated these domains in clinical care and they did it either really, really well um, and it struck you or very poorly? And in reflection, you were like, oof, um, that really could have been done differently. And it, like, essentially colored the interaction that they were having with the patient. So you're saying observing in, in others? Yes. Um, e- yes. Yes, I can remember one where um, I was very uncomfortable. Uh, uh, and it clearly colored the interaction. Uh, yeah. Are you willing to share or able to share? Um, okay. I'm just trying to think through it. Uh, I mean, it was a long, long, it was many, many years ago. Mm-hmm. It was many, many years ago. Um, but it was, yeah, it was um, while I was in training and uh, I went in, uh, I went in to see, I mean, we went in to see somebody and it was inadvertent actually. So the individual that I was, you know, anyways, the, Individuals that I was working with had certain, like we all have stock phrases. Um, you know, you walk into a room and you have your, you know, how's it going or whatever. Uh, and this individual had a stock phrase and it was for males in particular. And the stock phrase was, how's it going, chief? That was just what they said. And the individual that was the patient was an Aboriginal individual. Um, and their I, I think the individual got lost right at the very sort of right at the very beginning. Uh, and it, I mean, this was, this was a, a long, long time ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not sure if there was, uh, I don't know if there was anything that was kind of repaired um, after that, but that clearly would have set uh, a very bad tone and would have just, reinforced any of the structural biases colonial i mean you name it it uh, it was loaded with kind of everything yeah um it was terrible and as someone who bore witness to that or was in the um room while that happened what was your reaction or was there anything that you know sometimes trainees will share that's like okay when the staff left i felt like i had to like clean up 
the mess or at least spend that extra time. Yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah. Was it a, I mean, it wasn't a real, a real mess, but probably the, the issue was to overcompensate, you know, to sort of overcompensate on, you know, the subsequent, the subsequent discussions. Mm-hmm. I don't have a lot of recollection of what happened after. I just remember it just stood out in my mind because it really, it's like a lead balloon that dropped in the room. Mm-hmm. And and you could see it on the patient's face, I'm assuming. Yeah, partly because I guess I'd been used to it from my previous training, uh, mm-hmm. and my previous experience in family medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, shifting gears a little bit, when you reflect on clearly, you know, you've, you've experienced a lot, um, you've seen a lot, you've engaged in a lot of conversation, you've done a lot of training, how comfortable would you say that you are within these domains and what are some learning curves that you've set for yourself as you look forward? Well, I can't say that I'm comfortable. Uh, I'm aware. Um, I will check myself. Um, for me, the issue is that if I, if something triggers now, I have a checkpoint to either ask myself a question or ask a question of somebody either I'm working with or obviously the the patient, depending on the, um, depending on the interaction. I can't say that I'm comfortable uh, yet. And I am mindful of the fact that, you know, I'm a white middle-aged male. um, And sometimes, um, you you know, part part of the question is, am I the most appropriate individual to be having a particular interaction with somebody? Mm -hmm. Um, It sometimes has triggered a, discussion, you know, with patients about uh, does that individual feel more, more comfortable if I feel like there's not a good connection or I'm not doing a good enough job um, offering to the individual and saying, you know, would it be better with somebody, you know, with somebody else? Um, being able to ask that question, I think, mm-hmm. is important, giving people the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Most people don't take it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's not that it's happened a lot, but um, the few times that it's happened, the few times that I've offered, individuals generally have not sort of taken it, but mm-hmm. it's allowed at least to open a dialogue about why did we even ask that question, right? Mm-hmm. And what am I not hearing? What am I missing? What do I need to be doing better to help support the individual? So it's just about asking questions. Mm-hmm. And what are some barriers in your day to day that either you, like, you know, extrapolating from your own experiences that you think people might face in, in being able to have those conversations? You know, what do you think? The, yeah. the, the big thing is what's, you know, it's the clinical pressures. I mean, we're just so pressured. We have no time to, uh, you know, the, the idea of being able to provide comprehensive care um, within a setting where we don't have time um, is a huge issue. And the problem is that you will sometimes you know, you will sometimes find yourself or you will probably have to cut corners on mm-hmm. that aspect of the interaction mm-hmm. to just get through the day. So I think that that's it. I mean, the change, I think the change in our nursing model, you know, having the change from primary care nursing to uh, a non-primary uh, team model has uh, probably had a detrimental effect on the ability to incorporate those things. I mean, um Individuals can get training, but not being able to work in a team, it's not, I don't know that it'll work sort of plug and play, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, obviously the current stress with the new electronic medical record that's coming in, everybody's just completely, we're just, we're just in this zone now. Yeah. Surviving, just getting to the next checkpoint um, in a lot of ways. So I think that that is going to, that is going to be, um, that is going to be a barrier uh, for a while anyways, until people get comfortable. I mean, uh, yeah, it's going to be a barrier. People just trying to figure out how to push the buttons and get things ordered Mm -hmm. uh, is going to be a pretty big barrier. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, another pivot and and you reflecting on your own lived experiences where, you know, has there been an interaction that you can recall either professionally or personally where the other person Um, you know, didn't really recognize your personhood or your, like the interplay of your identities, um, didn't acknowledge your diversity or give you equitable or inclusive space that, that affected you, that lingers, um, as as something, uh, as that you've lived through. Um, 
not maybe um i'm i'm thinking i mean i'm thinking sort of in the extremes you know i've seen i've seen uh i've seen a few patients um you're thinking about me personally now or in my interaction with patients for example so whatever comes to mind right like so i mean i've had a few i've had a few interactions i mean again i am i am mindful of individuals who visually look different from me um uh haven't had any haven't had any feedback around that but i have had a couple of interactions with um patients who are lesbian where i have had the sense that you don't get me you'll never get me uh and that i've overcompensated and i was trying too hard and uh i felt like i wasn't i wasn't getting anywhere and i wasn't going to get sort of quote unquote let in um mm-hmm. um that you know the individual um the individual i think just it, it, and i mean it's more of a feeling that i had as opposed to sort of asking the question and opening it up mm-hmm. so i've had that that's maybe uh one or two one or two instances where that uh where i've sort of felt that way mm-hmm. and any examples that come to mind like intraprofessionally where like someone else within um the academic or a clinical silo um like that kind of interaction so not with a patient, but rather a colleague or supervisor or someone else. No, I haven't had any of those obstructions. I mean, again, I think that it's uh, you know it's a ref- it's a reflective of the fact that I've probably I've probably benefited from some aspects of white privilege, if you will. Um, you know, I, I you know I recognize I, I recognize that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, when I look around when I look around at the various different individuals in leadership positions at the university. Um, you know, the university is obviously trying to, um, you know, trying to put in place um, mechanisms to try to even the playing field, if you will, so that nobody is privileged, meaning everybody is privileged. Right. Um, but I, I've not. The, the 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 barriers that I've encountered, I don't think could ever be reasonably ascribed to EDI. They've mostly just been about the fact that, you know, maybe I wasn't able to do something or achieve something because I just personally wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was more just individual aptitude or individual Mm -hmm. attitude Mm -hmm. as opposed to something through EDI. Fair enough. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, You know, it, it, because often like the tokenistic examples that come to mind is, you know, I, Someone assumes something of me because I am BIPOC or someone assumes something of me because I am a woman or gave me advice that they wouldn't have given to my male colleagues. Like, And to be fair, those are very, like, obvious examples. And sometimes there's more subtle ones, right, where someone assumes something about me because I happen to be cisgendered presenting and, and all those things. And sometimes it's the converse, right, where someone assumed that I had privileges when in reality I don't. Mm. Um, right. Right. Okay. And then the last question that I have is, is there anything that we've not covered in this interview or discussion um, that you think is poignant and worth saying as it relates to the research topic, which is understanding how oncologists learn and understand the domains of EDI in clinical care? No, I think you've, I think you've, I mean, you've, you've, you've taken me to places that I haven't really thought about for a little while. So I think, uh, no, I think you've been, I think you've been pretty, it's been pretty thorough. Um, it's been pretty thorough. I'm trying to think we didn't really explicitly, and it maybe you just sort of customized it for me because I'm so, you know, I'm further along in my career and maybe you've got different questions that you ask trainees, but I, I do think focusing a little bit because, you know, Training is kind of that formative period of time where we really are forming who we are mm-hmm. through our life experience. So um, probably important to probe around that, particularly for people who are in more recent training programs as mm-hmm. opposed to, you know, somebody like me who went through, uh, you know, a training program 20 plus years ago where there was never going to be an opportunity because it wasn't really even on the wasn't really part of the landscape. 
But it does open, you know, this question that I, I'll pose to you is as someone who is within the academic silo, right, as someone who represents, you know, the curricular needs and, and that design, what are ways that you could see us or not organic, like organically would be great, but like more conscientiously incorporating this in resident training because it doesn't exist right now. Um, so, but what would that look like? Because you shared earlier, like experiential learning is a huge thing, but you can't homogenize experiential learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, again, I'm not, you know, given the fact that I'm not an educational expert, um, at a very superficial level, I do think that this should be more explicitly you know, sort of put into education pro educational programs. I think as uh, preceptors, um, we should be asking, at least asking the questions so that awareness is raised just to get people thinking about it. Um, I try to do that with trainees now um, to sort of ask, are there, you know, any, any EDI considerations, um, you know, that, that, that need to be, that need to be, I guess, flagged in how we're doing an assessment or decision making or interactions. How is that how is that um taken? Like how how what is the reception when you ask those probing questions? Um it's variable. I mean some people are um some people are receptive to it and kind of you know uh really um really sort of hook on to the idea of uh having an opportunity uh, to talk about sort of things, others just sort of move along, mm -hmm. just kind of pause for a second and then just kind of move along. It doesn't even really register. And, you know, my, my, my role, uh, is to at least get people thinking about it. And maybe if I feel it's important underlying, underlining to people that I think that this is, a, you know, it's a really important issue for a particular individual. Okay. And then I guess I'll pick your brain a little bit further, given that there is that that variability, right? People who are interested, who will engage in the dialogue and others who just they're like, uh, you know, I, I can't really be bothered. How do you motivate that group of people, the ones who are not interested, not keen, not um who are perhaps a bit more apathetic and feel like this is just another thing that's being put on their plate? How do you bring them to the table? Uh, well, I mean, you have to lead by example, I think is the first. Um, and I think underlining to individuals that this is what is expected and is what's necessary to be, um, the best possible provider slash academic that one can be. And to reinforce, I mean, reinforce the messaging, uh, diversity makes us stronger, diversity makes us better. Um, to ask people to remind themselves to think about, uh, um, you know, equity issues, particularly with, with patients, particularly if we're running into trouble, right? You know, the individual is not showing up for appointments, mm -hmm. just, you know, just reminding people to ask the question, might there be something else going on? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take a lot of time, right? It's not, it doesn't take hours and hours and hours of discussion. Mm -hmm. it, sometimes it can just be a probing question. Things aren't working out. Is there something else going on here? Is there something about you I don't understand mm -hmm. that is, you know, making it, making it difficult? Mm -hmm. making it difficult to, to, you know, whatever, get through treatment. So I, I think, um, you know, sort of leading by example and reminding people and, you know, sometimes you can, there are, um, you know, we do have resources. We can point people to literature as well uh, that can help reinforce this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's this gentle approach and just kind of having people thinking about it as they build their, build their knowledge base. Yeah. And then how do you, well, I guess knowing that, you know, trainees have the luxury of being in a framework that, that can be influenced, can be shifted, can be changed. How do you do that for someone who's mid-career? Well, uh, that, um, I'm not sure. The, the honest answer is I'm not sure. I mean, the first, you know, the, the first step is for individuals in leadership positions to um, express that this is important, that this is important within the institution. And that's clearly what's happened with the university. Um, um, and then, 
to personally champion it and to probably find other champions as well. And to also think about a little bit more on the long game, um, to recognize that, you know, part of it is, part of it is the future is the team that you're building. So, um, you know, making sure that it gets incorporated into recruitment because the world will, the world will eventually change, you mm-hmm. know, through, through recruitment as well. For sure. When you think about it from a, a, you know, building the perspective of building a department. Mm-hmm. Um, and any last thoughts or comments that you think are poignant and worth having within this uh, conversation before we sign off? No, I think this is really important work, Shivani, and I, can, I congratulate you for doing it. I think it really, really is important. And I'm, I'm looking forward to sort of hearing about what you find um, as you talk to individuals within oncology. And it'd also be, uh, you know, interesting to sort of get a sense of, you know, what's, what's happening outside of oncology? Like, where are we? Are we, mm-hmm. are we, are we maybe sort of resting on our laurels a little bit too much to think, well, we already kind of do this because we mm-hmm. deal with complicated, you know, complicated situations, complicated patients. We've been, um, much more thinking about early difficult conversations in oncology than, than other specialties. Mm-hmm. Are we really, you know, a little bit ahead or not? It would be mm-hmm. important to kind of know that. For sure. All right. Yeah. And with that, I will. Pause the triplicate of recording that is currently happening. Um, (laughs) Let's see. Stop.